Um, Dr. Davis was born and raised in Canada. He uh, earned his PhD at Oxford, and he remained in, uh, in England uh, with taking a postdoc appointment at Mullard Space Science Laboratory. See, even ah. said that right. <laughs> All right. He, uh, he was then offered a uh, faculty position at the University of Sask Saskatchewan. Okay, maybe I don't pronounce everything right. Um, and he start, while he was there, he started using the telescopes on Mauna Kea. So he, in 2002, moved to Hilo uh, and was appointed the director of the Joint Astronomy Center, uh, which is his current position today. And I, when we give him all a nice Maui welcome. Oh. All right. Okay. Thank you. My my ears are in funny shape. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for that, JD. So, I've spent most of my professional life using the telescopes on Mount Kea. I've never used any of the telescopes on Haleakala for any of my work. And so I've never had reason to come over here before. This might, I think this is only the third time I've been on Maui, the island. And I've certainly never been in this building before today. So it's a great pleasure to come over here and, and, and meet the people here and talk to you this evening. Um, so I'm going to take you through the tale, as it, uh, uh, as it says. And the tale of British astronomy in the Pacific Ocean, anyway, uh, begins obviously with this man, who needs no introduction. Uh, you're probably aware that Cook's first voyage to the Pacific was motivated by uh, to study the transit of Venus across the sun. Uh, he made that, those observations from Tahiti, and that observation, as you probably know, was really important for establishing the scale of the solar system. And it was on his third voyage to the Pacific that he encountered the Hawaiian Islands. He was the first European to do so. Um, and uh, Cook was also a not just a, a navigator and explorer, but he was also very fine um, surveyor and cartographer. And so this is the first map produced of the Hawaiian Islands, and it was produced by Cook. Um, the original wasn't colored, actually, uh, but this is actually, this is the original chart of the Sandwich Islands, which is what he called them. And so we are here. Uh, I, now, I have a passion for astronomy, but I have a passion for antique maps as well. I love looking at old maps because they tell us so much about what, how the maker of the map viewed the world at that time. Uh, so I love this. Uh, I wish I had a copy, but I don't. Um, Maui here is spelled M-O-W-E-E, -E, because to the English ear, that's a good spelling of the sound, right? And, and similarly, uh, a lot of these other spellings look a bit funny to us. So I live here. I live just north of Hilo. Um, and Cook died, of course, right here on the west side of the island. And so that's what this inset is on, in Kealakakua Bay. Uh, and the spot is right here. This is the monument. Now, here, I don't know how often you people get over to the Big Island, but uh, this monument is at the spot. And this little plot of land on which this monument sits is actually a little bit of sovereign British territory in Hawaii. It's been preserved in memory of him. Now, can we interject questions? Sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. He came in here and, and came to Kauai first, uh -huh. uh, and then explored the other islands, and then took off. C this was in the middle of his uh, attempt to find the Northwest Passage. Yeah. So he went off towards Oregon and went north from there, and then came back to Hawaii later. And uh, so that's what this is. This is the track of his voyages, and, uh, and, and so that's what all that is. And in this inset, there are two little anchor marks of where the two ships, Resolution and, and Endeavor, uh, anchored in the bay. Yeah, so I could talk a lot about this map, but we're not going to. Okay. Um, so let's move on to this. Uh, this is that the, the monument to his uh, spot where he died. And just a few feet from there, submerged in the water, you can find this plaque. It's very hard to find, but it is there. And so I have stood on the actual spot. So this was the beginning of a long association between Hawaii and Great Britain. And that long association has had its ups and downs over the years. But it continues today uh, because the British government continues to have a presence here uh, in the form of the two telescopes of which I am director. So we leap ahead a couple of hundred years now. Uh, tonight I'm going to tell you the story of these two telescopes. 
Um, I'll go on and tell you what they, how they work. Now, are there any British expatriates in the room? I thought my title might attract some, but no. So, um, these four people th were a comedy troupe from the early 1960s. Uh, they did a show called Beyond the Fringe, and so I just couldn't resist using the words. But So anyway, that's the last I'll say about them. What I really mean here is I'm going to talk for a few minutes about how these telescopes operate, because they don't use visible light, they use infrared light, and so I'll talk a bit about that. And uh, to do that, I have to give you a bit of a physics lesson. So I'm sorry about that, but, but I will be gentle. Um, and I'll take you through some highlights uh, of things we've discovered with these two telescopes. And then finally, I'll tell you what's going on right now, which is actually quite interesting in a perverse sort of way. So let's go on. I'll tell you, let me introduce you to these two telescopes. And I'll start, <laughs> yeah, sorry, with this picture of the summit of Mauna Kea. Now, I don't know how often you people get over to the Big Island. You probably have no reason to go there. But if you ever get the chance to visit the summit of Mauna Kea, I urge you to take it. It's just a fabulous place. You are aware, almost certainly, that it's a sacred place to the Hawaiian people, and we all understand that. It's also a very special place to astronomers <laughs> because this is where we unlock the secrets of the universe. So it's a really awe-inspiring location. The telescopes I will tell you about tonight are this one, the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, so you don't get any prizes for guessing that that is a British telescope. Um, and the other one is down here, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, and I'll tell you about both of those. Uh, and I should also tell you before going on that uh, Great Britain also had an interest in a third telescope here called Gemini North. Uh, this is a U.S. telescope, but Britain was a 22% partner for several years until they pulled out uh, in 2012. So I won't be saying anything more about Gemini tonight. Yes, it is, absolutely. So uh, let me just give you a brief introduction to them. Um, UKIRT is funded exclusively by the UK. Uh, the JCMT is uh, a partnership between these three countries. It's owned by the UK in partnership with Canada and the Netherlands. Uh, they've both been operating on Mauna Kea for many years now. UKIRT is now 35 years old, uh, and the JCMT is 27. So these are well-oiled, mature observatories. Um, when it comes to telescopes, size matters, right? So UKIRT, uh, for almost all of its time, for th the first 30 years of its life, was the largest infrared telescope in the world. Uh, it was overtaken five years ago by a new telescope in Chile called VISTA, which is four meters, only slightly larger. Uh, the JCMT at 15 meters is the largest submillimeter telescope in the world. I'll tell you what those terms mean in just a second. Y I don't want you to look at this and think, well, the G JCMT is so much larger, it must be better. Uh, that's not it. These two telescopes do completely different types of observations. So you can't really compare them with each other. Um, and I don't mind telling you, it costs money to operate these facilities. These are my budgets for the two of them. Uh, one is obviously a lot cheaper than the other. That's because of the way we've, we've chosen to operate it, and I'll come back to talk about money right at the end of the talk. But I will just say that the funds to operate these telescopes come from the governments in these three countries, and virtually all of it is spent right here in Hawaii. So it's an important economic factor as well on the Big Island. Um, because these two telescopes are both the British-owned telescopes, we run them both out of one organization, of which I am the director. And here it is. This is our head office. You can tell it's a British operation because of the spelling. Uh, and you can tell that this office building is in Hilo because of the blue sky. OK, so that's a big island joke. But Hilo is the rainiest city in the US statistically, so it rarely looks like that. Uh, and it, as I say, it is a British government operation, so we are registered with the State Department, sorry, uh, as an MFGO. And you do get a prize if you know what that is. It stands for uh, Miscellaneous Foreign Government Office. <laughs> there we are. And here we are. This is the staff. We have 48 uh, staff, and this is uh, not all of us, but some of us on a rare sunny day. Um, it has varied over the years, but in that picture, uh, well, okay, one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight. Eight out of that picture. Uh, and in the past, it was a higher fraction. Yeah. Um, in, initially, when these observatories were young, um, we had people sent out from the UK for three-year tours of duty. That was the staffing model. Uh, so they would be hired at a, uh, typically at the observatory in Edinburgh, and they'd spend three years out in Hawaii and then go back to Edinburgh to continue their careers there. <laughs> some do, some don't. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, now we just advertise internationally. So the British fraction has gone down over time because of that. But the ones who are still here are the ones who didn't go back, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so let me move on and tell you how these telescopes actually operate. And um, as I say, they don't use optical light. And so to take you through this, I'll begin with a rainbow. Uh, living in Hilo, we know a thing or two about rainbows. If you were to look in a physics textbook to find out how a rainbow works, you would find a diagram that looks like this. So here we have some sunlight entering a raindrop suspended in the air, and some weird things happen. The physical terms for these processes are these. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, all I really want you to get from this diagram is uh, white light comes in and separated colored light comes out. White light is actually a composite of all the different individual colors. And when light passes through a raindrop, those colors get split up. And so you get this pattern. Uh, because the geometry is very precise, you get a pattern on the sky which we call a rainbow. That's the natural version of this. You can recreate this phenomenon in the lab. So here's a simple example, uh, a triangular piece of glass, which we call a prism, will do the same thing. You can shine white light in, and you get a colored light out. We call this a spectrum, and every physics student memorizes the order of the colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Those of you of a certain age will look at that picture, and it will make you think of this picture. Aha, okay, some people are following, good. But I'm not going to talk about Pink Floyd tonight. But I will talk about this man. Uh, so William Herschel did a really important experiment in the year 1800. Uh, he was born German, but spent virtually all of his life uh, in England. And so th this painting represents the experiment. There's a prism mounted up here in the wall. So sunlight is passing in. He gets a spectrum of visible color spread out on his desk. And Herschel was trying to measure how much energy is carried by each of these different colors. So we would move this thermometer in and out of these different bands. And in the course of doing that, he discovered that if you place the thermometer right where it is in this painting, that is beyond the red end of the spectrum, the temperature went up. And so clearly energy is being received from the sun, but it's out here beyond the range of colors. And so the implication is we receive energy from the sun at a color that we can't see. In other words, sunlight is more than just the visible colors. There's energy beyond the red, and there's also energy beyond the violet, but he didn't know anything about that. So Herschel's name for this type of energy was called calorific rays. Uh, this is related to heat. Uh, nowadays, we call it infrared radiation, where infrared just means below the red. Um, now, this painting always amuses me because it's so idealized, <laughs> right? Anyone who's ever done a real experiment knows it doesn't actually look like that. He's got these nice telescopes in the background. He's got a nice clean desk. He's got a pad and a, a pen there. And, and he's obviously very thoughtful as he's playing with this thermometer. So I often wonder what he's actually thinking as he does this experiment. I'm wondering why his sister cleaned up the desk. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> 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 could you repeat comments and questions for the yes. audience? Yes. Yes, of course. OK, so nowadays we know, of course, uh, that light comes in a wide variety of different types. Um, and following from that experiment, so this is another diagram you'll find in the physics textbook. We call it the electromagnetic spectrum. These are all the different types of light. And visible light that we know is just this tiny band here. Uh, if we go beyond the violet end, we get ultraviolet light. We receive ultraviolet light from the sun. Uh, most of it is absorbed in the atmosphere by ozone, but not all. And the ultraviolet that reaches us at the surface can cause damage to your skin. That's why you wear sun cream. Uh, X-rays, of course, you'll all be familiar with. We use it for medical diagnostics as well as other things. Uh, gamma rays up here uh, are extremely energetic. As you go higher up here, the light is more and more uh, energetic. And as you go down, it's less energetic. So here's the infrared I spoke about before. 
and then we go through microwaves and radio waves. So these are all forms of light waves. The only difference about the visible region is that these are the only light waves to which our human eyes are sensitive. That's the only thing that distinguishes these light waves from all the others. So if I'm losing any of you, just think of these all, all of these different things as different colors. That's really all they are. Why am I telling you all this? It's because our two telescopes work in these different parts of the spectrum. They measure different types of light. So UKIRT, uh, as the name would indicate, uh, specializes in the study of infrared light, and the JCMT uh, is a different type of light which we call submillimeter. Uh, that really means in technical terms the wavelength is just slightly less than one millimeter, but don't worry about that. It's just way down here, further down in the infrared, and that'll be fine. So the next question is, why do we do that? What do we learn? Well, objects in space emit light through all these different colors, right? We get gamma ray bursts from objects in space. We get radio waves from objects in space. And to understand how those objects work and what they are, you have to study all these different forms of light. And to make it, there are various reasons why the infrared and the submillimeter are useful. But just to give you one that is, that is perhaps the easiest to understand, objects that are hotter emit light further up this scale, and objects that are cooler emit light further down. That's a simple rule to follow. Let me give you some examples. Here's an object that is really hot. You know it is. It's the sun. And you know, and I could tell you a story here about, about one of my students and the answer on a question, but anyway, I'll save that for later. Um, and, and you know that the sun emits visible light. It does that because it's hot. That's what we call sunlight. Here's an object that is really hot, uh, an oven. Uh, my oven at home doesn't go quite that high, I think, but pretty close. Uh, an oven doesn't emit visible light. It's not hot enough for that. But it does emit infrared light. And you can feel it because your skin is sensitive to infrared light. Um, OK, this is some guy. Um, I, I, I emit infrared light. So do you, uh, because we're all about this temperature. This is obviously a rough approximation. If I was really at 100 degrees, I'd have a fever. And I don't think I do. But anyway, uh, and this is obviously a very cold object, which also emits infrared light, but it's, it's very cool and very different from the others. So if I go back to this diagram I was showing you before, those four objects emit light at very specific places on this diagram. The sun emits visible light, as we know. And as you get cooler and cooler, you move further down into the infrared part of the spectrum. So now you can see very clearly that UKIRT is optimized for studying objects that are cool relative to the sun, but warm compared to an oven, whereas JCMT down here is, sorry, specializes in the study of light, which is really, really, really cold, in the study of objects which are very, very cold. Yes? So wavelength energy is infrared? Yes. Always. Yes, absolutely. Yep. The question is radiant energy is infrared. The answer is absolutely yes. So these telescopes obviously are optimized for studying different sorts of objects. And I'll take you through uh, some of the science that we do with them. But just before I do that, um, everything I've just been speaking about for the last five minutes is based on the theory of this man. Uh, James Clark Maxwell was a Scottish physicist. Uh, in my mind, he is one of the great physicists of history, but not nearly as well known compared to Newton or Einstein, for example. Uh, Maxwell did a wonderful thing. He took all the experiments which had been done before his time in electricity and in magnetism. They were all individual experiments which, which didn't really tie together into a framework. And he brought them together into one simple, self-consistent theory of electromagnetism. And it's totally summarized in these four equations. And if you were to take a physics degree, you would, you would learn these as Maxwell's equations. I see someone here bowing in front of them. Absolutely right. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is the basis of everything we do in astronomy today. And one of the predictions of these four equations, which I'm not going to take you through, uh, is uh, this thing called an electromagnetic wave. And to a physicist, these are oscillating electric and magnetic fields, but that's, we now know that that's actually what a light wave is. So it was a marvelous piece of work. Uh, Maxwell died quite young, as you can see. He died at the age of 48. And within 10 years of his death, uh, an experiment was done which, which proved this theory to be correct. 
So it's a bit of a tragic story. And I have to say, personally, I'm quite honored that I run a telescope that is named after him. So let me then go on and talk about science that is done with these two telescopes. And I'll start with the JCMT. And let me introduce you to this concept of dust, which many of you have probably heard of. But here's a great picture. This is the JCMT, actually, on the summit of Mauna Kea. Uh, and this is the Milky Way behind it. The Milky Way, of course, is just the plane of our own galaxy. And if you look at the center of the galaxy, which is about here, you would expect it to be extremely bright. The center of our galaxy is full of stars. Why isn't it the brightest thing in the sky? It's because the light from the center of the galaxy is absorbed by all this dark stuff. And we call it dust. Here's another example. This is the Horsehead Nebula, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And what you're looking at here is starlight that is absorbed by dust. This is another galaxy. Uh, this is called the Sombrero. Uh, and you see there's 100 billion stars in here, but you see this rim around the edge where it is dark. And that, again, is absorption by dust. And if you look at a galaxy face on, this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Again, you see these dark spiral lanes here. And this is all where light is being absorbed by dust. Now, what am I talking about? This is not the dust you find under your bed. It's a totally different thing. So, so I'll tell you the story here. Astronomers are really bad at naming things, <laughs> right? So, one of my favorite Calvin's, m one of my favorite comic strips is Calvin and Hobbes. And in one of my very favorite episodes, Calvin is ranting at Hobbes about scientists. They've got, they lack imagination. They invent such boring name for things, like the Big Bang. If I was in charge, I would have called it the horrendous space kablooey. <laughs> and to this day, whenever I go to a professional talk and I hear someone mention the Big Bang, there's a little voice in my head that says the horrendous space kablooey every time. So anyway, so this is another example. What is dust? It's a really, really bad name. Dust is microscopic particles of solid material. There are materials that exist in the vacuum of space in the solid form, but they only form microscopic grains, so you can't actually see them. So this is just a representation, obviously. Um, a better example is smoke particles. You know, if you see someone smoking a cigarette or whatever, you see the smoke. What is that? It's tiny solid particles, and you're seeing scattering of light off those particles. And this is very much the same sort of thing. So we could have called it smoke, but then someone would have said, well, where's the fire? You know, so, so you can't win. But anyway, so that's what it is. Um, and with JCMT, I told you earlier, we study very cold stuff. And one of the things we study is extremely cold dust. So this is an example. This is one of my favorite images. This is, um, this is a, a ring of debris dust-sized debris around a very nearby star. Epsilon Eridani is only 10 light years away. That star in the middle is an artist's representation because we don't see the star in submillimeter light. What we see is the cold dust around the star. Now, there is a cold ring of material around our own star. It's called the Kuiper Belt. It's a ring of debris out beyond Neptune, right? way far out in the solar system, very, very cold. And so this is an analog of the Kuiper Belt around another star. And when this was discovered, it was thought that the clumps here, the clumpiness of this belt, might indicate that there are planets around this star in that gap in the middle. And in fact, we now know that there are planets around this star because we've discovered them using different techniques. So there you go. With, with optical light, you can search for the actual planets. With submillimeter light, you can look for the Kuiper belt analogs. Offhand, I don't, but typically uh, the, temp the temperatures of things we see is, what units do you want me to use? Well, I'm, uh, Kelvin. Yeah, 50 Kelvin. Okay, pretty cold. Yeah. How many arc seconds wide is that? Like arc <sighs> I, I, I see these wonderful photographs, and then i got to realize the instruments sometimes are looking at a square, you know, 15 arc seconds wide. Is that three millimeters? This is, thanks to self, this is an 850 micron image. Um, uh, 
Yeah, that's right. So that is probably, so this is a scanning. This not a, so, so that's a couple of arc minutes across. Okay, so it's clearly this. I mean, it's angular Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. So I've just been told I have to repeat the question because this is all being recorded. So let me backtrack slightly. The first question was, what's the temperature of this dust? And I'm speculating, but I think it's probably of order 50 kelvins, if I can use that unit. And I'll come back to that question in a minute. And then the second question is, what's the size of this image, um, left and right? And again, I'm speculating, but I think that's probably a couple of arc minutes across. Let me show you another one. So this is in the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is a much larger image, a larger sampled image. So this took a long time to do. Um, and what you're looking at here, again, is very cold dust. And this time, the temperature is 10 or 20 Kelvin. This one I know. Um, and the bright spots in this image indicate where the cold dust is concentrated. So the brightness represents the density of material, but it's all very cold dust. Uh, so what this really represents is regions where stars are in the very earliest stages of forming, right? It's a very, very cold clump of dust which is collapsing under its own gravity. A and the only reason, the only reason it, it's... Um, we see it is that it's very slightly warmer than its surroundings. Yeah. Right? Do we see it as warmer because it One is at a time. <laughs> no, it's fine. Do we see it that it's as warmer because it is warmer or because it has higher emissivity? Right. The question is, do we see it because it's warmer or because it has higher emissivity? And the answer is, we see it because it's warmer. Right? Even though it's only 10 or 20 Kelvin, that's warmer than everything else around it. Right? The background of space is 3 Kelvin. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. Oh, yeah. Th this is actually a clump, and there will be several stars that form out of this. It's not two individual stars forming, right? It, it, it's a clump. There will be many stars that eventually form out of this. Yes? So you speak of this dust. Is it primarily, you know, crystalline? Is it crystalline? They're too small to be crystals. There aren't enough atoms to form a, a, a crystalline stru Sorry, the question was, is, is the dust actually crystals? And they're too small. So a crystalline form requires many, many more atoms to actually form the right shape than we have in these particles of dust. Yeah, Th they're irregular shape, irregular in shape. And is that dust the remains of the supernova explosion? Yes. Now, I wasn't going to talk about that, but this is a good question. Where did the dust actually come from? Question? Yes. Uh, where did the dust actually come from, and is it a remain of supernova explosion? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. So du the dust is composed of heavy elements. It's not hydrogen and helium, right? And so, as you may know, everything heavier than hydrogen and helium has to form somehow, not in the horrendous space kablooey, but in some later process. Some of them are produced in fusion processes inside stars and are ejected into space when a star dies. And that can be through supernova or something else. Yeah, so that, that's where the materials that make up the dust come from, absolutely. Okay, so I was just going to show you this picture as well, which is much the same thing, but this is the center of our galaxy. I showed you a picture of the center of the galaxy earlier in visible light. This is what it looks like in submillimeter light. Uh, it's much further away, obviously. And it's the same thing. The bright spots here represent clumps of very, very cold dust. There's a huge amount of structure there. But this is, let me go to my favorite um, image with JCMT. So the Hubble Deep Field is one of the most famous images ever taken in astronomy. I'm sure you've all seen it. I see lots of heads nodding. This is good. This was taken around, um, actually the date is on here, 1996 this was done. Um, and the director of the Hubble Space Telescope at the time decided to take, I can't remember, eight or nine or ten full days to stare at one spot on the sky. And he chose a spot which was free of foreground stars. The objective here was just to stare at this spot and see how deep can we go. What are the most distant objects we can see? And this is what came out. And I remember this when this image was uh, produced, and it's absolutely stunning if you get up close to it with a much higher fidelity image than I have. So this object here is a star, but everything else you see here is a galaxy. And so just think about how far you're looking there. Yeah. Is it, the question was, is this before the lens was corrected? And I, I think that was 1998 that that was done. So the answer would be no. But I couldn't swear to it. 
there are about a thousand galaxies in this image. If you look at the very same spot of the sky with some millimeter light, you see this. It could not be more different. So let me explain to you what's going on here. The first thing you'll notice is that this is really fuzzy compared to this nice, pretty optical image. Uh, the fuzziness is what we call diffraction. I would have to give you another physics lesson here, but we know exactly what that is. doesn't mean anything's wrong. Uh, that's just because of the size of the telescope. The only way to get around that problem of diffraction and produce a crisper image is to get a bigger telescope. I said earlier, size matters, and it does in astronomy. But what else is happening here? There's a thousand galaxies here. There's only a couple of smudges here. In fact, there are only five. If you do the statistics carefully, there are only five objects here that actually stand out as being above the statistical uncertainty. But one of them, if you take this brightest one, it is prodigiously bright. This one object is giving off as much energy as these thousand galaxies put together. It's incredibly bright. But, of course, we're looking at it in some millimeter light. So what you're actually seeing here is cold dust. So what's the explanation? This object is a galaxy, just like these ones, but it's a galaxy that is completely enshrouded in dust. So the light from the stars in the galaxy isn't getting out. We don't see it in optical light. But the dust is emitting some millimeter light, and that's what we see. <laughs> so I won't... I so I won't repeat that no. <laughs> for the benefit of the remote audience. So, so the, this was actually the discovery of a new class of object. It's a dust-enshrouded galaxy in the very early universe. These objects are very, very distant. Um, and so it's interesting because, so someone asked earlier, where does the dust come from? It's produced in supernova as stars die, absolutely. So. These galaxies existed in the very early universe. You have to have enough stars forming and dying and producing dust to make enough dust to form galaxies like this one that are absolutely full of dust. And so that's quite an interesting problem. Nowadays, we have studied about 100 of these objects, and we're moving on to study uh, larger samples to understand their properties better. I think that's as far as I go. Oh, no, not quite. Just before we leave the JCMT to talk about my other telescope, I want to make the point that doing, doing astronomy with submillimeter light is really, really, really hard. It's much harder than, <laughs> I sometimes say to my colleagues, it's way harder than doing optical astronomy. But anyway, you'll see what I mean in just a second. The first thing to note is the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent. When you go out at night and you look, maybe not tonight, you look up at the sky and you see the stars, what that means is the Earth's atmosphere is completely transparent. Starlight passes through the atmosphere to reach your eyes. For submillimeter light, that doesn't happen. Most of it is absorbed in the atmosphere above where you are. If we were just, if you had submillimeter eyes and you went out there and looked up, you wouldn't see a thing. So you need to go to a very high site, and it has to be dry because it's the water vapor in the atmosphere that absorbs the light. That's why we go to Mount Achaia. So here it is. This is Hilo, the town of Hilo, with Mount Achaia rising above it. Um, this is another picture of the summit. I showed you this before, but from a different angle. So Eukert is over here. The JCMT is right there. And, um, uh, and that, I think, is Hualalai in the distance. Um, and sometimes it looks like this. Sometimes it's covered in snow. This is actually one of my favorite pictures of the summit. So this is Eukert right here. And the JCMT is uh, painted white, so it's actually camouflaged uh, against Pu'u Poliahu right here. So that's the first thing. We have to go to a high dry site, and this is why we come to Mauna Kea to do this kind of astronomy. There are very few places on Earth where you could do this. The second thing is, some millimeter of light is very low energy light, if you think back to my talk about uh, Herschel earlier. And to measure it, you need very, very specialized devices. And it has taken years, it has taken decades to develop the technology to the point where we can measure submillimeter light now to take those images I showed you. So, practical astronomy, and here my, my optical astronomer colleagues will agree with me, practical astronomy is all about measuring light in the most sensitive way that you can. So, we need specialized devices, and this is 
the camera that was built for JCMT that made all those images I have just shown you. It was called Scuba, and it was operational for eight years for this period, and it was a revolutionary device. It was the world's first submillimeter camera, which made all those discoveries possible. It has been succeeded by a new camera called, imaginatively, <laughs> Scuba 2, which started working in 2011, and so we've moved from an orange can to a big blue box. Um, this camera, I can tell you, uh, in my time as director, has caused me a lot of um, anxiety uh, because it was several years late. There were technical difficulties with it. It was very expensive. I don't mind telling you this camera cost $25 million to build, and it's the only one of its type in the world. Uh, tell us what's I wasn't planning to, um, but I will. So the question was, you're going to tell us what's inside, I hope. Um, so most of what's inside that box is associated with getting it cold. Now, this is a really good question, actually, because I'm measure we're trying to measure light from cold dust. To do that, you have to have something which is really, really sensitive, and, and it has to be even colder. So the actual devices in here that sense the light and turn it into electrical signal are cooled to 0.1 of a degree above absolute zero. And so a lot of the volume here is the technology to make that happen. Yeah. So that's partly why it's expensive, right? I mean, this is really tough to do. So, um, well, just in case you're interested, the actual, super the actual detecting elements here are superconductors. Um, and if, you if any of you know anything about superconductors, we bias them right at the transition point. So if they receive a little bit of light, they warm up slightly, and, s and so the resistance goes up. And so that's how we do it. Yes, yeah, the question was, it's an array, and yes, it's actually, um, it's about 60 by 60, yeah, yeah. A and uh, as I say, these are the only devices of their type in the world They were custom designed and built for this purpose. Okay, so let me move on and talk about my other telescope, and I won't take as long this time. Uh, UKIRT is an infrared telescope, so we study different sorts of objects, and we use infrared light to do that. I'll just give you a few examples in this case. This is a device known as a brown dwarf. So I've used Fahrenheit here. I don't think in Fahrenheit, but, um, but I do know that's roughly the temperature my oven at home goes to. So a brown dwarf is an object that forms in exactly the same way as a star does. It's mostly hydrogen and helium, but it doesn't have enough. It just doesn't have enough fuel that means the center of the star never gets hot enough for nuclear fusion to start. So it's made of the same stuff as a star. It just doesn't burn. And so it is, it's just gravitational. Absolutely right. And so over time, it just cools off gradually. And so that means it's cool, it's faint, and therefore it's hard to find. And so we use infrared light because they're cool, um, and finding them is difficult. But this is one. And at this point, when we found this, which I think was 2006, this was the coolest brown dwarf ever detected. Um, that record has since been overtaken by a satellite mission called WISE, which specialized in finding this sort of thing. But we were very excited about that when we found it. That's technically very difficult to do. Let me give you an example at the opposite end of the universe. So I'm sorry, I've used the letter Z here. And because I'm British, I'll say Z. Um, but to you, that would be Z. Um, and so this is an experiment very much like the Hubble deep field I spoke about earlier. With UKIRT, we have picked out one patch of the sky, and we've stared at it for a long time. So any of you who are photographers will know that if you, uh, if you lengthen the exposure time and take a picture, you, get, uh, you can uh, get the, f the, uh, the fainter objects uh, in, in your picture because you gather the light over a longer period of time. And this is exactly the same principle, except that we've opened the shutter here for, I think, 700 hours to study this patch of the sky. And the purpose of doing that is to try and uh, observe very, very distant galaxies. And so to blow up one small region, look at this. Here's a very nearby galaxy, but every single speck of light you see there is a galaxy. So this survey is called the Ultra Deep Survey, uh, and it is the largest sample of very distant galaxies uh, ever taken. Yes, there's a question at the back. Yeah. 
No, that's okay. <laughs> so, th the question was, if you were on a spaceship heading for this brown dwarf, how would you know to avoid it? Is that basically it? Oh, well, as you got closer, of course, you would know it's there. I mean, it's a, it, it's a sun-shaped, sun-sized object, right? So, so you would, you'd see it pretty clearly if you were getting close to it. Yes, yes, but only faintly, because it's cool. So it does emit visible light, but not as much as a hotter object like the sun. So, so it does emit some, right? So you would never find it with an optical telescope on Earth, because invisible light is just too faint, right? But if you were close to it, you'd see it. Yeah, no problem. Oh, yeah, because that's too faint as well. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so let me go on. Um, here's an even more distant object. This is a quasar. A quasar is f uh, a prodigiously bright object, which, as I'm sure you know, um, occurs when material falls onto a supermassive black hole. They are very distant as a rule. Um, but before this, the furthest one that had ever been discovered was at a redshift of 6.4. I'm sorry. I'm getting technical now, but we use this thing called the redshift to measure distances once we get out to very large cosmological distances. And the, f the most distant one ever discovered was 6.4 uh, because that's as far as you can go using visible light. But if you search for these in the infrared, you can search for more distant ones. Uh, and so this one was, uh, so this one was discovered at 7.1. Now, it's really interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it indicates that a supermassive black hole existed very, very, very early in the history of the universe, less than one billion years after the, after the horrendous space kablooey. And, uh, and, and that's a bit of a puzzle as well, because a supermassive black hole is a hugely massive object. You know, how do they form so quickly? So that's the question there. The other question is, why have we only found one? It took us five years of a survey with Euchre to find this object. And to this day, it's the only one that's been found beyond this limit of 6.4 that you can do in the optical. So there's, there's some serious questions around this that we don't understand. And astronomy is great because every time you discover something, you have another question to ask. Uh, and just one more example. This object right here, this is the afterglow of a gamma ray burst. And in a gamma ray burst, as you may know, is a very energetic uh, thing that only lasts a couple of seconds. But, uh, and so the essence of gamma ray burst research is to find out what happened and so to train the telescope on it very, very quickly to measure the afterglow of the event. And in this case, uh, the burst itself was detected by uh, a satellite called SWIFT. And with UKIRT, we formed this image of it within 20 minutes, which was really good going, considering at the time it was cloudy and we were closed. But we got the alert, and so we opened the telescope just to see what we could do, and we got this. And it turned out, at the time, this was the most distant object discovered, observed by any telescope anywhere. Um, and that's no longer the case. A more distant gamma ray burst has been seen since then. But for a while, we held that record. So this just gives you a flavor of some of the things we have done with you, Kurt. It's going on at almost equal zero. Well, not quite. not quite. That's right. Um, let me give you another example of science with you, Kurt. The galactic plane I've spoken about earlier. So this is the Milky Way. Uh, it's a long strip. Uh, and so a team in Edinburgh has combined measurements from Euchert with measurements made in the southern hemisphere by a telescope called VISTA in order to get the whole plane that's visible from the Earth. And in that, uh, this is just a blow-up of one region. Let me give you a blow-up of some other regions. This is Euchert, uh, part of the image. There are more than a billion stars altogether in this survey of the, of the galactic plane, and 90% of those have never been seen before for exactly the same thing I was just describing. They're too faint in visible light, but you can see them in infrared light. This one in the middle here, this is actually the center of the galaxy. This is how it looks in the infrared. Okay. So let me come on to the last part of the talk. I hope I've persuaded you that these two observatories on Mauna Kea have been doing great science for many years. Let me just change tack very slightly. In 2008, something really important happened that affected all of us. The world's economy fell apart. This was the best example I can think of to show you. But we all know th uh, that this happened. 
And the response to that in different countries was different. Um, the UK did not fare very well out of this. Um, and it's very interesting to compare the UK and the US and how they dealt with it. In the US, as you know, President Obama uh, decided on that stimulus was the right response to this. You can debate whether that was the right thing to do or not. Uh, in the UK, the response was exactly the opposite. Uh, in 2010, David Cameron's government was elected and they decided that austerity was the right response to this. And so they cut government spending left and right. And it was really quite severe. Uh, this is a diagram that appeared in a British newspaper which shows the UK government's budget and how it is split between the various departments. This type of diagram has become known, at least in Britain, as a blobogram. <laughs> but the, and the size of the blob represents the size of the budget, you see. So the, the, government, the total government budget in this year, 2008, was 621 billion pounds. And here's the Department for Work and Pensions. This is the Treasury. That's the fine. This is the Department of Health. Uh, here's the Department of Defense over here. And up here, this orange one, this is the Department for Innovation, Universities, and Skills. So this is basically um, business and education. And there's one sub-blob, if I can use that word, which represents the research councils. Uh, these are the people who actually pay for research to be done. So this is like the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. And that budget is 3.3 billion pounds. So you could debate whether austerity is the right thing to do when the economy is struggling. And I really can't stand David Cameron personally. But the one good thing I will say is the British government has, and the American government, I think, as well, have both recognized that the key to getting out of economic difficulties is through technical innovation. Technical innovation only happens if you have a strong research base. And so while uh, many of these government departments have had their budgets slashed by 30% or more, really, I mean, it was, it was really bad, uh, the, science, the science budget has been protected and it's been kept completely flat for the last five years. So that's really, really good on the one hand, right? The importance of science for economic recovery has been recognized. It's really, really bad on the other hand because a flat budget means you have decreasing um, decreasing capacity because of inflation. And that's what's been happening. So the pressure, the so this is a long way of telling you that for me the pressure has been on. So I've had to think about protecting uh, the funding for my two telescopes. Um, if you were, and so obviously they have to be as good as they can. If you were to ask me what makes a successful observatory, I would give you these six criteria. Uh, I could spend the whole hour that I'm here talking about these because these are exactly the things that an observatory director worries about on a daily basis. You know, do our users want to use it? Is the facility productive? Do we have the scientific impact, et cetera? And I could persuade you, if I had the time, that we've been very successful at all of these. However, that's not the whole story. In a time when cash is tight, there is always an imperative to find savings from somewhere. And so my budget has gone down over the years. I've had to impose savings on the operation. It's also true that the UK science budget, although it's fixed, there are higher priorities than my two telescopes. And finally, because we have a site on Mauna Kea, uh, there's a liability that goes with that site because the UK government has an obligation to restore the site at the end of operations. And so in accounting terms, uh, the UK government has a liability to a foreign government, and no one ever likes to be in that situation. So, so the question was, what's the life of these telescopes? And that's an excellent question, because both of these telescopes can keep going for another 20, 30 years, no problem. Right? The science case is there to do it. They've both been kept completely up to date. So there's nothing here that's going to stop working all of a sudden that makes them uneconomic. So the outcome of all this was my funding council, uh, goes by this name, uh, made the decision in May of 2012 to cease the operational funding for both of these two telescopes. They did. These are the actual words that appeared on the website. And so that was obviously a dark day for me personally. I remember it very well. And so I've taken the approach here of putting them both on the open market because they didn't decide to close them. They just decided they didn't want to pay for them anymore. So 
we've been trying to find some new entity to take over the operation of these two wonderful facilities. And I decided to take a complete open market approach to doing this, so I issued announcements of opportunity um, which were circulated to everyone around the globe in the astronomy business. I produced these two glossy booklets. I call them prospectuses because it's just like issuing shares, right? I want you to know what you're getting for your money. And by the way, we're not selling these two telescopes. You can have them for free, right? All you have to have is the money to operate them. You could have these two telescopes. Well, I mean, that's one model, right? I mean, that's not the way we do it, but you could rent out the time and make money that way. Absolutely. Yes, question in the back. Yes, yes. Now, that is the critical point that I was alluding to on the previous slide. So the question is, don't you also have to have the money to decommission them and restore the site at the end of their life? And that's absolutely true. Uh, however, I wasn't going to mention this, but since you raised it, the deal here, and it states very clearly in these booklets, whoever takes on these telescopes will get a check from us to cover that because we hold the liability at present, oh. right? If you wanted this telescope, you wouldn't take on that liability without some compensation. Yeah, but don't you have a bond that was posted? <coughs> the question was, don't we have a bond that was posted at the beginning? And the answer is no. The there's an agreement. There's an agreement. We've signed an agreement that we will decommission and restore the site. So the UK government is liable. It's not in a bond. It's just an accountant line somewhere. Yeah. So that's right. So whoever takes these over is going to get a check from us to cover that liability so that we're clean of it. Yeah. So it's the deal of the century, really. <laughs> Any interest so far? I, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So just hold your horses. So let me just say a word about the legal framework for this. It's complicated because of the um, situation here in Hawaii, but the University of Hawaii is stepping up to the plate and helping us make this happen. So we are going to terminate our existing sublease for the site, and then UH will set up an agreement with a third party to operate these two facilities, and it's going to be done separately for each of the two telescopes. For UKIRT, I can tell you that the third party is, wait for it, a partnership between the University of Arizona and Lockheed Martin, the aerospace company. Now, the University of Arizona it has one of the largest astronomy departments in the country. So it's entirely appropriate that they should get involved in, uh, in Mauna Kea. They don't have any facilities there. And Lockheed Martin, I've learned to my benefit, uh, has uh, a group that is, uh, that is just a research group. And they're interested in studying um, uh, space debris. So the technical term is space situational awareness. Uh, to you and me, that's space junk, uh, because they've realized there's a commercial niche for them. The company that knows where the space junk is and knows what it is controls the navigation lanes through space. And uh, so that's their commercial interest in this. So a lot of the work that will be done with UKIRT in future is uh, space debris and uh, near-Earth objects, which is what the University of Arizona is interested in. So that's all going ahead. Uh, the legal part of this has been very difficult, as I've indicated. There's nine legal agreements, and lawyers are involved, and it's all taking much, much, much longer than I would like. So when I wrote this slide, I thought we might get this done by the end of August. But with each passing day, I'm becoming increasingly skeptical. But anyway, that's what's happening. Yes? Are you part of the package deal, or can the new partners just bring in their own people? How, how does this all, how does, how does well, this yeah, so that's a wider question. So the question was, am I part of the package deal? But, but the wider question is what happens to the current staff, right? So I showed you a picture of the staff earlier. So the basic principle is that when we leave, when STFC leaves, we will lay off all the staff, and they will all be rehired by this new outfit, right? I have to lay them off. They're employed by us. We're leaving. Um, so, but the new people taking over the telescope we m would be mad not to keep the people who have all the experience and all the knowledge. So formally, they'll be laid off by us and hired again by them. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's you, Kurt. Let me tell you about the JCMT, which is even more interesting. The response to JCMT has been this. So a new partnership is forming, and it begins with these four institutes, which, if you look through, these are all in East Asian countries. This is a Taiwan. This is in China, this is South Korea, and this is Japan. 
These four countries have looked at the example of what's happened in Europe with the formation of ESO, and they've realized that they can be more effective working collectively than working individually. And so they have formed an umbrella organization called IACOA. And they have proposed to take over the operation of the JCMT. Now, this is really interesting because some of these countries are shooting at each other. You know, you know they're in dispute over bits of barren rock in the ocean. But and so in talking with my astronomical colleagues, you know, they've said to me, we believe we can show, demonstrate to our governments that we can work together. And that has to be a good thing for the human race, not just for astronomy. So the plan is that JCMT will be transferred to this new outfit called IACOA. That again requires a number of legal agreements that we are now working on, and we hope to get that done by the end of October. So when this happens, the British presence on Mauna Kea will come to an end. And it is actually quite sad. So the nearest analogy that I can think of is this. This was in July 1997, and this is the ceremony by which uh, Great Britain returned Hong Kong to China at the end of a 150-year lease. It was terminating a lease. This is exactly what we're doing. You know, it is actually quite similar. So this is, uh, this is Prince Charles. That's Tony Blair, who was prime minister at the time. Uh, this is Chris Patton. He was the last British governor of Hong Kong. And as part of this ceremony, the Union flag was lowered and handed to him. And I remember watching this on television and he had tears in his eyes at the time. It really was a very emotional um, occasion. And I think it'll probably be quite emotional when, when, uh, when we leave uh, Mauna Kea as well later this year. And when that happens, this will be the last vestige of the long British association with Hawaii, this little plot of land with Cook's Monument. And so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> the question was, am I going back to Edinburgh? And the answer is, I'm not sure. I might be going back to the UK. I might be doing something different. Who knows? Uh, an excellent question. <laughs> yes? In terms of the, uh, the optical telescope, you have, to, uh, you have to produce a very fine contour of the reflecting surface of the, of the collecting element. And in the mil submillimeter telescope, I'm curious as to how precise yeah. that, uh, that dish is in terms of waviness or departure from the ideal curve. Yeah, an excellent question. So. The question was, how accurate does the surface profile of a submillimeter dish have to be? Um, it's a 15-meter dish. Yeah. When I tell people that, they, they say, wow, I didn't know you can make mirrors that big. And the answer is, it isn't an optical quality mirror. Right? So you would not want to shave in it, for example. Yeah. Uh, if you were to look at it, in, if you were to go up and look at it, it's, it's got bumps on it, you know, where wrenches have dropped on it and things. So radio telescopes are strictly mechanical things, and they don't have to be very accurate at all. Optical telescopes are extremely accurate. We're in between. So an optical telescope has to be accurate to, to my, you know, less than the width of a human hair, is typical. Less than the wavelength of light but sense. Yeah, but, but a some millimeter telescope, uh, ours is accurate to about 22 microns, if that means anything to you. So it is... It's a complicated system because our, I didn't even show you a picture. The JCMT's dish is actually made up of a number of segments. Uh, each of those segments has adjusters on the back. So we measure the profile of the dish using an optical technique, and then we adjust each of the segments to maintain the figure. Yeah. So although it has little bumps uh, averaged across the surface, it's accurate to about 22 microns. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. What's absolute zero in Fahrenheit? Does anyone in the room know? 459. So it's minus 459. Yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me backtrack. The question was, if those detectors are at 0.1 Kelvin, 0.1 degree above absolute zero, what's that in Fahrenheit and how do we get there? Yeah. So it's complicated technology. It uses... We start with helium. 
Uh, liquid helium gets it down to about 4 Kelvin, 4 degrees above absolute zero. After that, we have to use an isotope of helium called helium-3. This is a form of helium which only has two neutrons in the nucleus instead of, only has one neutron in its nucleus instead of two. And it has a lower boiling temperature, so we get down to about 2 Kelvin that way. And then we use a device called a dilution refrigerator, um, which is a complicated beast that even I don't completely understand. But basically, you, it uses... When you, when you evaporate a liquid, um, heat, is heat, heat is absorbed in the process of that. If you take a liquid and you repeatedly condense it, heat is released. So you just keep condensing the helium-3 and you take heat out of it. That's right. And it cascades down until you get to point 0.1. That's right. Yeah. Actually, the coldest point in that fridge is, is, is less than is 0.05. Yeah. It's all electricity. I know. Yeah. Where does it come from? The grid? Yes, from Helco. Oh, so, this, so here's another question. When, when we installed that, that fridge, my electricity bill doubled. <laughs> yeah, because we consume a huge amount of electricity, condensing the helium to keep that thing cold. It's weird, isn't it? Because you're trying to get something really cold, and, you, and you're filling it with, with energy from electricity all the time. But, yeah. Yeah, it's large. Uh, what's the surface of your microwave reflector? Is it aluminum? Or what's the surface of the microwave reflector, I was asked. And the answer is yes, it's aluminum, but the actual segment is a very complex sandwich pattern. So to keep, there's a honeycomb pattern with just an aluminum skin on the top. Uh, so that keeps it very lightweight and deformable. No, that's right. Aluminum is cheap and easy, and, and it's perfectly adequate. Yeah. Yes, at the back. Yeah, they're going to carry on doing exactly what we've been doing. Um, because the, the real story here is that the British government is cutting off the money, and we're nowhere near done what we want to do. You know, there's lots and lots of science remaining to be done, so they're just going to pick up where we left off and keep going. <coughs> oh, yes, I had that right at the beginning. Uh, for you, Kurt, it co it's just over $1 million a year, 1.2. And for JCMT, sorry, the question was, what are the operational costs? I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Um, for you, Kurt, it's $1.2 million. For JCMT, I think it's about $5.6 million per year. question was, on the Brown Dwarf survey, what percentage of the sky have we covered? And I don't know it in percentage terms, but I can tell you that that survey covered about 7,000 square degrees of the northern sky. Yeah. What, what's the full sky? 43,000 square degrees, something like that. Yeah. Where's the Keck telescope? Where's the Keck telescope? It's on Mauna Kea as well. They're all telescopes. So the Keck telescope is there too. Yes. And who operates that? The Keck telescope is a corporation, but it's run the partnership is the University of California and Caltech, California Institute of Technology. Uh, NASA is also a minor partner in Caltech. So it's interesting. Uh, let me go if, if I went back to those pictures of Mount Okay with all those telescopes, it's a very heterogeneous mixture. You know, there's a Japanese telescope. There are several U.S. telescopes, obviously. There are two British telescopes, but not for long. Um, so it's interesting that it brings in people from all over the world to work there because it is one of the very best sites. It's frustrating because there are many times we would like together, we would like to work together on things, and it just turns out to be frustratingly difficult because someone wants to do something else or, you know, finding common ground can be difficult sometimes just because it is such a heterogeneous mixture. So other than the University of Hawaii, is there no American Foundation scientific foundations or uh, money to help with this kind of telescopes? Question is. Ah. Question is. 
Yeah. So the question is, other than the University of Hawaii, there are no American foundations or universities to run the telescopes. And, well, the University of Arizona, of course, is going to take over the operation of one of them. Uh, so all I can say to you is I put out the announcement and, and waited for people to come. And I will tell you that for you, Kurt, I got 12, 13 different responses to that announcement, uh, only one of which is actually going to get it. Uh, of the other 12, you know, there was a whole mixture of things. Some of them were not serious, but some of them were from other American universities who were interested, definitely. Yes? Is there a sub, big sub, sub millimeter telescope in Chile? The question is, is there a submillimeter telescope in Chile? And the answer is yes. And the, the big new shiny toy in submillimeter astronomy is called ALMA, which is actually an interferometer. So it's a collection of 64 telescopes to study submillimeter light. Now, ours is a single dish. That means they do fundamentally different things. Are they running at one, one millimeter? Is that their wavelength? Or ALMA actually operates at a wider range of wavelengths than we do. So they go to shorter wavelengths and they go to longer wavelengths. So they had the same detector, I presume, the superconductors. The no, because the technique in ALMA is completely different. So they don't use the same detector technology that we do. Yeah. <sighs> it's they're trying to do different science, so that's not really the right question to ask. Um, I didn't even talk about this, but on the JCMT we have a number of radio receivers which use radio techniques rather than just taking images like I have shown you, and that's what Alma will use. They'll use those radio type receivers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. Oh, Magdalena Ridge. Gosh, all these questions. It's amazing. <laughs> this question was, what do they do at the, at the Magdalena Ridge Array in New Mexico? Uh, and I don't know much about that, but I believe that is an optical infrared array instrument. Um, Yeah, that's all I can tell you. I really don't know much about that. We were asked to get involved with that at one point, and we didn't. So There was no money in the British system, so we couldn't. Yes? On a personal level, are, are you going to be, uh, are, do you want to stay, or are you going to be sad to leave, uh, leave the work? Well, I don't know if I am leaving. So, uh, you don't know. So, so, I mean, that's a personal question. Yeah, it is. And uh, so what I will tell you is I will be, immensely sad when my time at the Joint Astronomy Center is over. I have loved working there. I have loved working in the best astronomical site in the world. I have gifted and dedicated people working for me. What could be better, right? Yeah, really. And yeah. whatever I do after this, it won't be as good as what I've been doing. That's good. That's good. All right. Thank you. Very good. Okay.